when I asked Pam, um, well, I need to tell them something about you, and she says, well, tell them I'm the mom. So she's going to tell you what that means. She is the chief uh, learning officer for the uh, Florida Virtual School, and uh, we're delighted to have her here with us. Uh, she'll uh, uh, have some presentation and interaction with you till lunch, and then after lunch we'll come back to her and uh, finish up with that. So, Pam? Uh, as I, I'm so fortunate, I feel so fortunate this morning to get to sit here and listen to you. Um, and I, I admire what you're about to do. And the one thing that I would like to say before I start is even, it doesn't matter, at least you're doing something. And that's how you're going to feel as you continue to progress. I couldn't decide, as I sat here and listened, if I was sitting at Florida Virtual School 10 years ago, or if I was sitting at Florida Virtual School last week. And that's one of the things that I'd like you all to think about, is the things that you're thinking about now, and you're starting to think about, and you're starting to kind of bring out into the open. Even once you're done with these 18 months, they'll continue to change. And they're going to change faster than ever. What I wanted to do this morning was bring you some background of Florida Virtual School and then bring to you the issues that I hope are relevant to you. And then rather than having this be a PAM presentation, I thought it would be fun to have a group presentation. So I'd like you to be ready to ask some tough questions and we dig down into the, the bits and the pieces of what we're doing at Florida Virtual School that really do interest you, concern you, and you have questions about. Um, Florida Virtual School, 1997, we started out, and what we really were was a little bitty old project, and we were a little grant between two districts in the state of Florida, and um, we actually had co-principals. For those of you who've met our CEO, you know that we no longer do. Um, Julie Young is our chief executive officer, and um, we, we were this little bitty organization, and what we had was one course. And I bet you can guess what it would be. Online learning, 1997, one course, what were we were designed for? AP Computer Science. And we had 77 kids. Okay, that was 1997. What the milestones along the way for us is we went from being uh, grant funded uh, two years later, we became line item funded. In 2002, we became uh, FEFP funded, which everybody has a different term for that, but uh, we're part of the funding model for the state. The most interesting thing about us, as time went on, for those of you who've heard about us before, is that we've become performance-based funded. And I'll speak to that a little bit later. The, the, um, in 1997, when we began, uh, we began with a mission, and a single mission, and that was to revolutionize education, one student at a time. Like you, we grappled with beliefs. We spent, it felt like eons, and we brought in facilitators, we brought in stakeholders, we spent days and days and days doing mission, value, belief statements, much like where you're, what you're talking about today. The beauty of that is, to this day, we, we have them on walls, we talk about them. It's not something that we've just thrown away. And our number one belief, and this is what, this is what built our culture, was that every decision we make, the student is at the center of. That gets real tough sometimes, by the way. It, it sounds glorious, but it gets difficult. Every decision. And the second belief was that we would create a community of learners where risk and trust were of very high value. So, we're going to revolutionize education. We created the beliefs. And then we were built upon, in 1994, as you know, Prisoners of Time was written. How many of you read it? We were built on the concept 
that we were going to change those two values. That time was going to be, um, that time was going to be the variable. But how in the world were we going to do that? The first thing we did was to develop courses. We didn't develop courses because we wanted to be software developers. We developed courses because in 1997, there weren't any. We built them on the following things. Number one, students must be engaged for learning to occur. Students must be engaged. And the way we did that back in 1997 was that all of our courses were built around motifs. Number two, learning must be relevant. So, so all of our, all of our uh, projects, all of our learning, had to be, the students had to be able to relate it back and forth, but had to bring it into their daily lives. So that meant some of the learning occurred online, some of it occurred offline, some of it occurred wherever, wherever. It didn't matter where. Number three, time. Student, we, we are, are uh, our little glitzy phrase was any time, any place, any path, any pace. The idea was that students could work at any pace. That, of course, lasted about six months. Because what we soon learned, at the time I had a middle school child, what we soon learned that if you tell a 13 or 14 or 15 year old boy that he can mow the lawn any time he wants, <laughs> how high is that grass going to get? So what we, did, what we do believe, though, is that students can work at their own pace, as long as pace connotes forward motion. So students can go fast. <coughs> students can take time. That time element is huge. Students, students we have students who uh, perhaps they are professional, name that tune. Maybe they're professional entertainers. Maybe they're professional ball players. Maybe they're professional, we have race car drivers. We have opera singers, so they may be on tour for a month. As long as they show forward motion, what difference does it make? What difference does it make? The other thing is open-ended discussion. You all were talking about that earlier. And projects. Imagine, do any of you have uh, teenagers at home? Aha! <laughs> imagine, imagine uh, you're if you have a teenager at home who perhaps isn't, isn't overly excited about education, you put them online, and you want to assess their learning. What kind of assessments do you have to have? You can't have multiple quests, multiple choice. You can't, you can't assume, okay, my son's name is Brock, okay Brock, now don't look back at any of the lessons and answer these questions. You better design open-ended, higher, higher level critical thinking skill type assessments. Um, as far as uh, course design, the other thing we did was put all of our courses on a three-year de redevelopment cycle. Boy, we, we thought we were the cat's meow. Because if you look at textbook adoptions, I don't, I don't know Texas, Florida, they're five and six years. Is that about right here? Not the same? A little bit longer? So we thought, okay, a three-year course redevelopment cycle, that would mean that courses would always be fresh. That's what we thought in 1997. Somebody today mentioned the 300 the 3,330 theory based on technology? You did, right? I can tell you this, three years isn't fast enough based on the way our students are changing and based upon their needs. So those are the courses. Now let's talk a little bit about what delivering instruction looks like at Florida Virtual School. We currently have about 450 teachers, 308 full-time teachers, and the rest are adjuncts. Every one of us works on an annual contract. We don't have tenure. 
Our teachers work out of their homes. They don't punch clocks. They're available to their students eight to eight every day of the week. The, um, when a student signs up for Florida Virtual School, we have moved to a, what we call a rolling enrollment model. So our kids um, uh, come to us constantly, constantly. So let's say, for example, I'm teaching a course at Florida Virtual School. I will have no students on the same page. I will have no students stopping or starting at the same time. I work 12 months, and oh, by the way, I'm expected to figure out ways to get those kids to collaborate. They're not even in the same place. Boy, that's hard for us linear thinkers, isn't it? By the way, you know, all of us in this room, we think pretty literally. You know how our students think? Concept maps. Seriously. Those of you who have teenagers at home, are they gamers? Ever seen him or her start at the beginning of a game? Never. The, um, back to the instruction at Florida Virtual School so you get an idea. Students, when we say online learning, one of the misconceptions is that uh, that's all kids are doing is being on a computer. Our teachers are required to be in touch with the kids via phone, with the parents every month via phone. Our teachers are available through the courses, through email, through IM, through phones. And now, through webinars. Our teachers do a lot of real-time uh, <coughs> bringing in experts from all over the country through webinars. Our teachers bring authors in through webinars. Um, so we have a lot of of that practical kind of experience going on. In addition, um, the, uh, the, our teachers work a 12 month year. So that it, it never, there's ne you never close down the classroom and start again. We are mandated to serve all students in the state of Florida who wish to be served grades six through 12. About 75% of our kids are public school kids about 20 are uh, homeschool, and about five are private. Kids take on average two courses with us a year. We have a student-teacher ratio, and then and, and, and a kind of, because we're performance-based funding, so we actually have quotas of completion. So, for example, if you're at Florida Virtual School and you teach geometry, you have, you have no preps. Keep in mind, your course is all built. You have one course, geometry. Let's, let's put you, and you teach, you would complete 120 credits in a 13 month year. That would be your quota. So if you, if, if you, if you equate that back to the classroom, um, uh, and that changes our AP courses, that number is 90, and then our, uh, uh, our courses, with the exception of math and higher level sciences, are 135. So you pull that back into the classroom, extrapolate it out, it's about 18 students in your classroom. We are accredited. We are legislatively funded. We, are, we operate as a district, a school, and then of course as a private entity, actually, because our courses are in 27 states and five countries. Do we offer diploma? Absolutely not, and the reason why is that we are affiliated with every school district in the state of Florida. And in order not to create accidental adversaries, we, our goal was never to swipe kids. Our goal was to um, assist kids in all kinds of learning situations. One of the things, with, with the mandates that we were given by the legislation was to bring money back into Florida virtual school somehow because we're free to all the kids in Florida, to um, continue to develop courses. Therefore, we have an arm called Global Services. It is the goal of Global Services 
to um, uh, lease courses throughout the United States um, and in the country that wants. And that, that, those dollars come right back to Florida Universal School for, for course development. We also have a private um, arm which uh, teaches the courses outside the state, like the onesies and twosies, that kind of thing, so that students um, outside the state can have take online courses from Florida Virtual, and they do that through Stetson University. Of our 400 and some odd teachers, uh, almost 100 are national board certified. We also offer uh, quite a few different perks and credits and a heck of a lot of training. I heard somebody else talking about you know, get, making sure that our teachers are involved in these kinds of discussions and making sure that we continually offer our, our teachers professional development. When you're online, the beauty of that is that you can have professional development anytime, anyplace. So our teachers are involved in a great deal of uh, collaboration and professional development virtually. We wanted the best of the best of the best, and we, um, we started, we did hire some folks from out of state. In addition, um, our teachers, when our teachers' um, spouses got transferred to another state, they could stay working for us. Imagine the benefit, imagine even the financial benefit to that. We currently have um, 40 employees living and working out of state. Now, there's a caveat to this. There are some tricky issues with workers' comp. Because workers' comp is state by state by state, which we are working through. Our dream, our goal, is to have teachers all over. Why should it matter where the teacher lives? As you know, we have quotas. As you know, we're performance-based. So we do not get a penny until a student successfully completes a course. So it doesn't matter, um, because we have no seats. So if a, um, a teachers can earn extra dollars for going over their quotas, then the entire district can earn dollars if we go over quota. Then we have, of course, the AP bonus program, which I'm sure you all have. Then we have an innovation bonus program. And one of the things that we try and do is encourage innovation. So whether you had a successful or, un it's not about being a successful innovation, it's about bringing innovative ideas to the forefront. And then of course we have the national board and I feel like I'm forgetting one. So that gives you an idea. And um, I, I want to talk about teacher accountability because that's real important to us. And we're real proud of our accountability levels. We, our teachers work in learning communities with what we call instructional leaders and what the rest of the world calls principals. So, so they're small learning communities. We have um, a back-end system that provides um, a great deal of accountability. For example, we have phone logs. We, and, and then we have all kinds of ways to aggregate that information. We have, um, you know, when you work online as a teacher, at first it sounds very attractive, but you have to be okay about working in a glass house. Because everything you think, do, say, write, feel, everything is right there. We, um, we actually do walkthroughs, classroom walkthroughs, where we're looking at specific feedback, we're looking at email, we're looking at what we call footprints when our teachers are available for the kids. And then, of course, your kids are your greatest major because the kids are giving us feedback all the time too, as well as parents. And we, we're very fortunate. We have wonderful, wonderful people who are um, you know, it's very different when you start uh, su oh, supervising, working with people who you can't see. <laughs> I bet that, that that's a very different concept. Some of us have been doing it so long, that's what we think everybody does. Eleven are AP courses, um, and the rest are, are offered as regular and or honors. What's interesting, what has happened to us, is over the years there's been a flip-flop. 
when we first started, we used to say, and if any of you saw any of us speaking in uh, the late 90s, you would have heard us say, online learning isn't for everyone. And one day we looked at each other and we said, what would happen if you marked out that word online? How discriminatory is that? We began to change our whole belief system, and with that has come a ton of credit recovery kids. Currently, probably about 30% of our kids are credit recovery. One of the things that we started looking at um, a couple years ago was gaming. Now, I'm not talking, I, and I, I use this term very derogatorily, I am not talking about Barney matching games. And everybody's not in your head, so you know what I mean. That's not, a pro that's not what I'm talking about for a high schooler in an online course. You know, match Shakespeare to his picture. That's not what I'm talking about. I am talking about RPG, role-playing games. Now, you guys are those teenagers at home. Are, 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 you have a gamer. Is, is he or she a role-player? Okay. We started looking at it. We are actually in the process of um, doing some R&D with a couple of firms on gaming. But, but we've also had an opportunity to do a great deal of research. And here's what I think we're going to find. I think in the end, we're not going to be the coolest new game in town. Game. I think in the end, there is a great deal to learn from the research on gaming. If you look at gaming and gaming principles, and as superintendents and you read those, they're going to sound a whole lot like something you already know. Because the principles of gaming follow the principles of good learning. And, or vice versa, maybe. And what you're going to find a couple of things that, we, that we're seeing in, in the gaming world, of course it has to be engaging, but it really changes the role of the teacher. And that's the hugest piece. If you, if, um, if you are into multiplayer role-playing games online, where you go into a whole world, has anybody seen Second Life? Make me talk to you about Second Life. If you go in and you watch um, a, a teenager game and get involved in that world, couple of things you're going to notice. If it's a multiplayer role-playing game, there will be a game meister. That game meister has an interesting role. That game meister is the facilitator, the mediator, the mentor, and the player, too. So that game meister goes in and out of a role of what we might think of as teacher. It goes teacher, learner, learner, teacher, teacher, learner, learner, teacher. There's no longer any great big T. And I think we're going to see that as a huge difference for the future, the role of the teacher. And I think it's going to be an interesting, challenging change. My mom, my mom was a social studies teacher for about 200 years. And the um, funniest thing in the world was to be, for me is to think back on walking into her classroom. Because, you know, it's pretty cool to have a mom who was a teacher. Walk into her classroom. Now, let me tell you about my mom's classroom. She was considered way, way ahead of her time. I mean, she traveled all over the world with kids, da, 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 da. But in her classroom, she, it was a theater. And it was her theater. And, and I, think, I think that's going to be a tough change. I don't think that's changed that much. Okay? So the, so, so the, gaming, the gaming piece we're looking at the other piece that really concerns us are learning pathways. In a very remedial, rudimentary way, our courses are designed for that. But not really, not really totally the kind of pathways that kids need. If you, why would we make a kid who was really good at algebra, had all the standards down, all the concepts down, and could zip through it, sit in an algebra class with me. Why would we do that? The cruelest thing we can do to a child is bore them. Okay? And, and please don't throw anything at me, but the last thing, if you really think about it, the last thing in the world you really want is successful high school students. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that high school success is a short-term job. 
You don't want a 40-year-old successful high school student. So uh, to sum it up, we're looking at, at gaming as the, the principles behind gaming. We're looking at um, the, uh, 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 the pathways, the learning pathways. And, um, and then finally, um, the other thing that we have done that might be relevant to you is um, we have actually uh, incorporated, and it's been in, uh, in effect now for about three years, a year-long mentoring uh, program with every one of our teachers. Our teachers come to us with a minimum of three years of experience. Most have about 12, but they get a mentor of their very own for a full year in the online world. And I know um, probably many of you are looking at the ways to affect change with, you know, at your teacher level. And boy, that mentoring program, to have a standardized mentoring program really helps. So those are the three things that I, I, I wanted to bring back up this afternoon. Um, the, um, and, and I guess my final comment to you all is that I'm sure Mark talked to you about all this, but when we're looking at, at, the, at our students and what they're doing and what they want and need, if you really look at what, and I'm sure Mark talked, you know, talked about YouTube, talked about MySpace, talked about Facebook, probably talked about digs, maybe talked a little bit about RSS technology, talked about iPods, blogging. You know what that really is? You know what we're seeing that kids really, what they tell us they want? They want, more than any other generation, to be content creators. That's what they are when they're out of school. When they're not in our classrooms, they're content creators in one way, shape, or form. And, 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 and what I, what? I, I said her and our business being content givers to those classes. You bet, it's real hard to give that up. But that's what they, look at Wikipedia. That's what our kids are doing. And, and they're getting value from that, and that's how they're building their communities. Whether you or I approve of MySpace or not, there are tons and tons and tons of other learning communities out there that kids are using where they are content creators, where they, where they, um, <clears throat> where they actually self-police themselves, where they actually rate things, where they actually are, are making, a, a, they're synthesizing, they're analyzing, and, and one of the things, that's the third thing that we're looking at, is how in the world um, we can create a, a, a format where kids can be content creators. Is that the intent or is that the result of just wanting to be heard? I think it's a mix. I think about this a lot. You know, I, I almost think that in as fast-paced as kids' lives are, as uh, many of our students' lives are extremely structured, um, I think they're looking for community. I think that... Um, that's not content. Looking for community is, is being heard, and they may not be getting to be heard at home or right. at school. Right. I, I think, I, I just really believe, I could be proved wrong in a year, that they truly want to be content creators, and that perhaps we can guide them into that, Whereas right now, I think it's a lot of being heard. I, I, think, we, I think we're on the, on the cusp of a great opportunity. We can capitalize on their desire to be heard, though, by, by exactly. channeling the content. Exactly. I, I don't, isn't that where development curriculum comes in? I mean, if, if they want to be content creators, but it's a lot about just being heard. But if we have the curriculum, we can channel that to where they're not just trying to be heard, and it's, it's, it's channeled towards something that we want them to do. Well, it's hard That's to serve people if you correction. don't go where they are. I, I agree. And then also part of choice, that it's in the, it's in the content, within the information that we're, we believe is important to understand that, that they create their content for the choice we offer, <clears throat> if we are able to offer choices for students. But isn't that bridge that select these kind of we're, that's what we're wrestling with. He says that we, we have to design them a work that they find engaging about the things that we want them to learn. Absolutely. So it's that connection so between what we want them to learn and the ways that they like to learn. And if we can figure out how to make that bridge, then... Well, they're we, telling us what's relevant to them, and we're saying that we want to make education relevant. It, 
it's our relevance instead of their relevance. And, and, and by offering choice, they get a chance to place their content and create the content that we guide them with and to. You know, when we think about the motivational question, well, kids just don't, they're just not motivated. Well, if they're powering down, they're, they're awfully motivated, you know. It, it, they're just not motivated about what we're having them do. I mean, you're, you're talking about highly motivated people. That, the fact that they would use that term at all is astonishing. Well, what control group doesn't desire to control? <laughs> <laughs> where we're headed, the target, what it is we want kids to know and be able to do, and, and we, they are inventing the target, the goal, and determined content, but if they have opportunities to express themselves and we help them do that in the right way, then we get the choice. I'm saying it's not a bad thing. Everybody that's ever been controlled has a desire to be controlled, so I mean, they're, they're, it's a workable situation. This may not be a comfortably workable situation. Uh-huh, there's the book. Well, you know, there's... It's a different way of thinking. It's a different yeah. way of thinking. Uh -huh. One of my mentors taught me to get power by giving it away. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we need to learn to do that with our students. Like well, we know that ourselves being superintendents. I mean, the old guard superintendent had total power. If we okay. tried to... If we tried to... We still do, Michael. If, if, if we if we if we try to act that way, we'd be shot down. You know, we've learned that power is it's a different kind of power. But every time you try to think of an example, because we're so new to this, it seems to be trivial. But you know, I was thinking about okay, if you want to get them to learn something in science, Wikipedia is open and it's free. I mean, it's out there. The people, what's on Wikipedia is from people who have freely posted it. What, you could have kids say, okay, we're working on this in biology. Your task is to post something out on Wikipedia that explains this. Well, now that might be something they like to do rather than finish this homework assignment and turn it into you tomorrow. We have, um, from the very get-go, we have a, a group of people, our public affairs liaisons, <laughs> whose job is to do um, gypsy marketing, where you just get and go and meet and meet our guidance counselors are on the road uh, about 60% of their time. They actually meet face to face with all the guidance counselors throughout the state, make sure they're kept up to date on the opportunities and options for students. Yeah, so, but at the same time, access cannot be denied. In your work on looking at gaming, have you figured out how to embed those basic um, elements in those in the games you may be developing so that when the kids are working through maybe working at real high levels they're also hitting on and mastering those things that might be on the fcat prinsky wrote an article about gaming and um, in it he talks about how educators disagree about gaming we're at the point we're at the point where you all are going to be in about the third to fourth time you meet we're at the knockdown drag out stage about how to do that and um, and if you ask me that six months from now, I'll probably be able to answer it better. Because we have a lot of different pedagogical beliefs on how to do that. We have the good fortune of, of getting to go around the country and talking to students, not only in the state of Florida, but around the country, about what they want uh, from an on, mostly we ask about online courses, obviously, what they liked about it. And of course, when we started doing that, we thought for sure we we're going to hear all about gaming. Or interactive kinds of things. And the one thing that we hear resounding is, I love having a teacher who cares about me. And not about gaming, not about, not about all that snazzy technology peripherals. It's having a teacher who cares.